All righty. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Great to see you here. Welcome to Current Topics in Sustainability Science, the first, the very first event in a week of discussion regarding sustainability and climate change. A very special welcome to Professor Sarah Turner and the graduate students taking this advanced seminar in environmental science, who you'll hear from today. Before passing proceedings off to the organizers to provide you with a bit more context, just a quick word of welcome on behalf of Force Space. Concordia University's Force Space is located in downtown Jojage, Montreal on unceded indigenous land. It is a physical space whereby we collaborate with our community to make research initiatives or course activities such as this one publicly accessible through interactive experiences. So we're currently uh, recording this event and it'll appear on our YouTube channel and we're live streaming at CU for Space on Facebook. I've put the link in the chat. Please feel free to share that stream on your page if you wish. You're more than welcome to join in the conversation today by sharing perhaps encouraging thoughts and comments in the chat throughout. And we would urge you to use panelists and attendees from the pull down menu there in the chat. Choose that op option just so we can all see your comments. Each student will present for three minutes and that will be followed by a one minute lightning question round. So if you have a burning question after the presentation or during, please pop it into the Q&A. This will make it a little bit easier for us to discern that this is a question we can address during the question period. Okay, on that note, it's my great pleasure to pass the floor over to Jim Grant. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Anna, and to Fourth Space for hosting our fourth annual Sustainability Across Disciplines Conference. Uh, we're really delighted to be here again, even virtually, but we have a great lineup for you, a series of discussions and exciting events over the next uh, five days. Uh, I want to re reiterate what uh, Anna said. Uh, I want to acknowledge that Concordia University is situated on unceded indigenous lands and Montreal is traditionally known as Jajoge. Well, uh, this year our topic is sustainability and the, the climate crisis. Uh, even though the pandemic is top of mind right now, I think we cannot forget that uh, the climate crisis is still lurking there as the most pressing issue that faces mankind today. And unfortunately for the next decades and maybe the foreseeable future. So we're going to talk about the science. We're gonna talk about uh, all sorts of other interesting topics. Um, and let's get to our very first uh, event, which I'm really excited about because it's a series of uh, presentations by the graduate students of uh, the seminar environmental science. Uh, Dr. Sarah Turner is a professor of geography, planning, environment, and she is the professor for this course. Sarah is also um, a member of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center. Um, I should have mentioned that this conference is being hosted by the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability and the Loyola Sustainability Research Center. Uh, Sarah, why don't you take it away and introduce the first student? Thanks, Jim, and thanks to Rebecca and Anna and the host, the Fourth Space, for hosting this event. Um, yeah, we're really excited to be here. The Advanced Topics in Environmental Science uh, Graduate Seminar from the Department of Geography, Planning, and Environment. So. The students here are in the Masters of Environmental Assessment, um, the Masters of Environmental Science and our PhD programs um, and have a broad variety of topics in sustainability science to discuss today in their three minute um, presentations. So um, without further I would chat, I would like to hand it over to Alexandria to give the first presentation. Go ahead, Alexandria, when you're ready. Thank you. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. So when I immigrated to Canada, the economic and lifestyle differences there versus here were obvious. Trinidad and Tobago is part of the Caribbean and they are considered a small island developing state also known as SIDS by the United Nations. SIDS is recognized as their own distinct group of developing countries which possess unique vulnerabilities due to the climate crisis. There are currently 58 listed by the UN. An increase of drought, coastal loss, and food insecurity is inevitable. Since the world's most virulent infections are highly sensitive to climate, we could see an increase of infectious and vector-borne diseases due to climate change. 
With already overwhelmed health systems on each island, SITS must be outfitted to be sustainable and climate resilient for the short and long term. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, along with the World Health Organization, have begun to create standardized island profiles to identify and measure the risk indicators on each island. I have used Trinidad and Tobago as my case study, and the following are challenges which have been identified in the literature. Firstly, climate change modeling along with the design of creating resilient health systems have been done on a large scale, covering large land masses and generally cannot be condensed to fit the much smaller scale of islands. As such, modeling should be done per island if possible. Secondly, even for larger countries, access to data sets have been limited. It is no surprise that the current data sets therefore do not include the same risk indi indicators that SIDS need to be measured by. Each island is unique, like a pearl, with their own geology, natural resources, economy, and governance structure. Islands are also completely surrounded by water and low-lying. Once the proper data sets are collected, evidence-based adaption plans should be created. Implementing these policies will be most successful if adaptation and response plans are customized per island. A one-size-fits-all approach should be avoided at all costs. Finally, the last two barriers that go hand in hand were the lack of information regarding opportunities for accessing international financing and the lack of country eligibility to access these funds. A lack of experts in relevant fields on the island means that the international community can play a role in assisting SIDS to access this information in hopes of getting the financing they need. Knowledge has only value if it is shared, used and built upon empowering small island developing states to participate in developing climate resilient health systems and assisting them accessing research data and international funds is one of the ways we can build resiliency to overcome current and future challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandria. Does anyone have a question? I have a question for you, Alexandria. What do you think is the, do we, can we take away a lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic in relation to small island nations? Is there um, something you can tell us about this current issue in relation to sustainability? Oh, you're muted. Certainly, thank you. Because I still have family on Trinidad and Tobago, I have been communicating with them during COVID. Uh, the first thing that the small island nations seemed to do was start isolating themselves because it seemed that other people in the world were not very attentive to that. Now, because there is stress on the health systems, um, all the normal issues that they're dealing with, it's actually exasperated right now. For example, I have an uncle that was dealing with heart issues but due to COVID, they did not have the resources that they would need. So looking forward, we really do have to create health systems where the international community is more aware of this. For example, uh, first world countries were able to buy things like vaccines, small island nations, along with developing countries, for instance, um, they have been helped by larger countries as far as pooling together to get the vaccines that they need. So I believe that COVID has shown us that we do have to come together a lot more. Thank you so much, Alexandria. Thank you. Um, next, our next speaker, and that was Alexandria Farrell Kulas. Um, our next speaker is Brian Armstrong. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, Brian Armstrong. Uh, thanks for having me today. When I was a boy, my dad took me fishing on the Bruce Peninsula of Lake Huron. We caught two smallmouth bass and pan fried them for breakfast. Just that, fresh caught fish, butter, and a bit of salt. It was the most delicious thing I'd ever tasted. I think fish is so delicious because it's such a great food. It's your mouth telling your body you're doing the right thing. Global fisheries provide 3 billion people with a significant portion of their animal protein intake, but aside from protein in places where poverty and malnutrition are highest, fish supply essential nutrition in a single perfect package. 
But even beyond nutrition, why do I remember that experience so clearly? How did that fishing experience nourish me in my development? It allowed me to witness where the food came from. It connected me directly to the source of that sustenance, the land and the water. It strengthened my father and I's bond and worldview and so much more. I got to thinking about this again when I ran into some settlers in ice fishing in La Salle or Tsiganawate where the rapid is. If they have access to fish in their local supermarket, why did they spend all day in the cold on the ice together to possibly or more often not catch a fish to bring home and clean and eat? The Quebecois settlers learned these ways of living from the original people of this land. In the North, for many indigenous communities, fishing is not just a form of sustenance, but a way of living. My research in par partnership with the Cree Nation government and the Hunter Trapper Association of the Cree of Iwishi on James Bay examines the value of subsistence fisheries in overlapping discourses of food security, food systems, and the EU Edwin, the EU way of doing things. On the ground level, this means the formal partnerships and organizations, environmental co-management frameworks, food security programs, Hunter Trapper security funding, back to the land programs for youth, nutrition education, and health and environmental monitoring initiatives. How these relate back to subsistence fisheries and are often governed by complex state indigenous relations and how they function pragmatically and what is most successful for the Cree. I believe cataloging and understanding these initiatives and relationships can put fisheries and food security back into the greater context of cultural well-being, environmental stewardship, and belonging for long-term intergenerational sustainability. On a greater level, it means fostering partnerships, respecting the UEDWEN and what we can learn or unlearn to bring back to the way we as settlers conceptualize our place and role in the world. So you may have noticed I like to tell stories and I'll tell you one last one. In the spring, my daughter and I were wading in the St. Lawrence River and my daughter was amazed at all the tiny minnows tickling her bare feet. I hope that in future, I'll take my daughter fishing and teach her the deliciousness of fresh caught wild fish the same way my dad did for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Does anyone have a question for Brian? I have a quick question if nobody else does. Uh, I was wondering whether your research includes concern about fish no longer being as healthy <laughs> as it used to be. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely in the north and around UHG, uh, there's monitoring of mercury and, and that's a huge issue. Um, and there are programs that monitor where and when and what species can be caught to limit that. Um, but general, generally, there's also um, some research that shows that in, in many cases, uh, in a, on a moderate diet of consumption, consumption of fish, uh, the benefits outweigh the risks. Okay, thank you, Brian. Our next speaker is Kai Bruce. Hello, yeah, I'm Kai. Thanks for having me today. Under mounting pressures of more frequent and severe environmental crises, the limits to sustainable development are revealing themselves. The triple bottom line mentality of sustainable development in a narrow definition of social environmental dimensions has not proved itself as an effective tool for sustaining all livelihoods. These pitfalls can be seen at the highest scale in international targets such as the 2015 Sustainable Development Goals. Goals like these ignore the structural and systemic inequities that face Indigenous communities all over the world, but this is particularly true for the many remote communities in Northern Canada that still lack basic infrastructure, health service provision, and education, among other things. As such, there's been a growing call to allow for a pluralistic definition of sustainability and solutions to today's environmental crises, one that accounts for all people. Globally, there's an increasing recognition of the value of Indigenous knowledge and notions of well being and sustainability, but the Western sustainability discourse continues to exclude considerations of the livelihoods of Indigenous peoples. This systemic marginalization is problematic for Western societies who have come to see value in Indigenous knowledge systems. There are many political, ethical, 
and intellectual hurdles to bridging Indigenous and Western visions of sustainability. For one, the sustainability of Indigenous life and culture itself is threatened by the enduring processes of settler colonialism and Canada's history as a resource bank. This has put Western and Indigenous sustainability on an unequal footing. Along with the dispossession and erasure of Indigenous peoples and their cultures in Canada, Western sustainability discourse is also oriented around economic development, a mentality which is increasingly seen as the root of many environmental issues and social injustices that we face today. Furthermore, the Canadian government is fundamentally unprepared for the task of making space for Indigenous sustainability as a result of its refusal to cede real jurisdiction over land to Indigenous peoples. Epistemic differences between Indigenous knowledge and Western science further complicate approaches to pluralistic sustainability. Environmental issues have typically been framed only through a Western lens and therefore neglect the central importance of land and reciprocity with the land that exists in almost all Indigenous cultures. Collaborative approaches, therefore, will need to respect the integrity and validity of all knowledge systems and focus on a bridging of knowledges rather than an integration. As well, these collaborations will need to involve a decentering of the state to create spaces where Indigenous people can practice sustainability on their own terms. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Does anyone have a question for Kai? No one else does, I guess. I have a question for you. Um, I'm wondering what you think a good concrete first step would be, maybe particularly in education. Um, in what in what level of education do you think? Whatever you whatever you would like to address, I suppose. Yeah, um, I think in the in where I mentioned decentering the state, I think just decentering white Western patriarchal um, views of sustainability and environmental studies in curriculum, I think is a large one. Um, and focusing on kind of a like a auto ethnography of focusing on oneself and like the power structures that you or me and other white settlers in the institutional system um, perpetuate and benefit from among other things thanks thanks next up alessandra Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Alessandra Salaghi, and today I will be presenting my topic of hydrocarbon contamination remediation in Northern Canada. So we'll start off with what is hydrocarbon contamination? It's the contamination of soils due to petroleum hydrocarbon, PHC spills, caused by oil transportation, storage, or during the refining process. PHC contamination is particularly dangerous to environmental and human health, because these organic pollutants bioaccumulate up the food chain and can cause cancer, mutations in genetic materials and other effects in humans and animals. So what does it have to do in Northern Canada? Well, 60% of contaminated sites in Canada are due to PHC contamination. And this has become a multi-billion dollar problem due to the extents of the contaminations and the large number of sites. However, due to the remote locations of these contaminated sites and the colder temperatures that slow down natural processes, remediation techniques have to be chosen carefully. An approach that has been proven effective by researchers and scientists is a bioremediation cleanup of these sites. Ex situ bioremediation has been most commonly used rather than in situ, and the two favorite ex situ practices have been land farming and biopiles. So land farming consists of excavating and spreading the contaminated soil in thin or thick uniform layers. Then nutrients are added to the soil and mixed occasionally to promote the loss of hydrocarbons through volatilization or degradation. Biopiles consist of a system of aeration under the soil to enhance microbial activity, particularly in northern sites. So to represent how bioremediation is in reality an effective method, 
we'll quickly take a look at an example from Polkdale, Newfoundland and Labrador. It's a remote community with a population of around 600, and the only way to reach the community is by air or boat via Goose Bay, which is 800 kilometers away. It was decided that a temporary XT2 bioremediation treatment facility was to be built in Folkdale to treat the contaminated sites since transporting the soil to the existing facility in Goose Bay would be risky. At this facility, they built a biopile and treatment lasted for one year. Once the soil was dumped in the biopile, it was mixed with granular fertilizers, then local staff would periodically visit the site to manage the leachate that filtered through the, bio, uh, sorry, filtered through the pile before it discharged to the environment. This whole process encouraged bioremediation through volatilization, even in temperatures that remained at around zero degrees Celsius for more than six months. So overall, the effectiveness of bioremediation on hydrocarbon contaminated soil in remote, in remote northern communities is seen as a prospect for treating the several other contaminated sites in northern Canada. Thank you. Thanks, Alessandra. Does anyone have a question? I have one, Sarah. Uh, nice talk. Uh, what's the fate of, of the hydrocarbons? Is it CO2 into the environment or into the, what's the fate of the CO2 by, by the two methods, I guess? I haven't really looked at it, so I'm not really like a science -y person, so I haven't really looked into that end. Um, but so far, the research that I found hasn't really brought up any of those kind of concerns. So I'm assuming that any kind of extra emissions that these processes might emit are controlled and they're not of concern. Thank you. Next, Naomi will be presenting. Oh, sorry, Sarah. There's another quick question from oh, Alexandra. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I was wondering by chance if you came across any literature or research uh, that explains how they prioritize which sites they'll um, they'll do remediation on first. I don't think I didn't find anything in the research, but I found like a federal government website that kind of listed uh, current success stories, and mo mainly all of those stories date back from any site that was contaminated for like at least thirty years or something. So I think they're kind of backtracking on things that have existed for a while, and now with these new technologies that are being developed, they're kind of prioritizing those like initial ones and then slowly going through all of them. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alessandra. Over to you, Naomi. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Naomi, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Indigenous knowledge and sustainable food systems. Food systems from production to consumption are one of the largest contributors to anthropogenic climate change. Making food systems more sustainable is needed not only to mitigate environmental impacts, and secure food sources for future populations, but is also necessary to protect the social and economic systems related to food practices on which people, communities, and their livelihoods depend. Recently, food justice scholars and activists have sought to position food systems within a broader social, economic, and political context. Our current food system has been produced and is maintained through the systems and structures of capitalism and colonialism. These structures are power-laden and operate on the continuous exploitation of nature for profit, the exploitation of bodies for labor, and the attempted erasure of Indigenous people from their land and culture. In light of this, there is growing recognition that large-scale transformation needs to occur for food systems to become more socially and ecologically just, equitable, and sustainable. However, the logics of capitalism and colonialism are more than economic imperatives. There are cultural ideologies that stem from a certain worldview. They reflect and reproduce a particular set of values, beliefs, assumptions, and knowledges that both legitimize their actions while reinforcing exploitation and dispossession. This worldview and its impacts are operationalized in the organization and governance of food systems. Therefore, achieving truly sustainable food systems demands rethinking, reconsidering, and decentering these values and beliefs. Historically, indigenous food systems have been undermined, delegitimized, and excluded from Western frameworks of food systems and food sustainability. But indigenizing food sustainability discourses, 
through deeper and more meaningful engagement with indigenous worldviews and knowledges can provide a powerful alternative to challenge the capitalist colonial ideal. Indigenous worldviews commonly emphasize a relationship with land and other than human beings that is rooted in values of reciprocity, mutuality, and respect. This relationship is sustained through land-based practices that are regenerative, both culturally and ecologically, and are informed by embodied and holistic knowledges. Traditional access to food through hunting, fishing, and gathering, and cultural food practices, including ceremony and sharing, are sites where Indigenous relationships with land are enacted, and therefore represent rich sources for knowledge re related to building a sustainable relationship with land through and by food. Working to recognize and revitalize Indigenous food systems and related knowledges has the potential to make space in Western conceptualizations of food sustainability for Indigenous ways of being and knowing. Importantly, this can provide a framework for achieving food sustainability that goes beyond dualisms embedded in Western practice towards more just and holistic understandings of food and food systems. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Um, any questions? The attendees, I just want to remind you, you're welcome to write questions in the question and answer um, panel, and I will read them out for uh, the panelists. I have a quick question if nobody else does. Alexandra, do you, do you want to go first, actually? I just saw your hand. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I was just, um, I was just wondering in regards to the food systems, um, I noticed that with Indigenous communities, the further north you go, uh, for example, towards Inuit communities, the price of food increases dramatically. So I was wondering um, if you had any suggestions of what the government could do uh, to heavily subsidize that, that, uh, that big influx. Um, yeah, for sure. I think a lot of the increase in food prices has to do from a shift from traditional foods and subsistence living towards market-based foods, which has of course been encouraged by policies and, and actions that have removed Inuit, for example, from uh, access to practicing those kinds of traditions. Um, and the ability to carry that out. And so it would be work to kind of reverse those and uh, rebuild capacity and ability within communities to carry out traditional activities. Thank you. Rebecca, do you want to ask your question quickly? I can ask it very quickly. I was just wondering if you could tell me about the photo on the left on your slide. What's sure. going on in that photo? <laughs> yeah. Um, that picture is from uh, Curve Lake First Nations of uh, rice harvesting um, and just north of Toronto. And there's some tension with between cottagers and settlers and First Nations in the community over the use of the lake um, for harvesting versus recreation. Thanks very much. Um, Alice? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alice. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I'm going to be talking to you about housing today. <laughs> okay. So, shelter is one of the most basic human needs, and yet access to this human right is becoming a challenge for many city dwellers, especially to those that are most vulnerable. Part of this problem is due to increasing rent hikes, rent evictions, and other unethical landlord practices that displace waves of tenants due to lackluster housing rights. Another major contributor to the issue is environmental hazard, um, which pose a significant risk to the housing sector, where poor housing is a major driver of vulnerability to climate change. Having a stable home is not only a critical determinant for mental I mean, physical health and well-being, um, but for environmental sustainability as well. Despite this, North American cities are finding that they're unable to meet the basic needs of their constituents due to the fact that good quality housing located away from environmental hazards, proximate to amenities such as grocery stores, parks, and public transportation, and are affordable are rare or virtually non-existent. 
this lack of adequate housing, tenure rights, and social equity not only constrains a household's ability to cope with and adapt to the changing climate, but also in direct and indirect ways accelerates environmental degradation. In the Canadian context, the inaccessibility of housing affects renters disproportionately, where housing discrimination based on race and socioeconomic status continue to act as a significant barrier to the housing market. Data from Statistics Canada and the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation show that renters are much poorer, younger, and colored than homeowners are. And these are not isolated incidents. And statistics continue to show the pattern that the people that need housing the most are the ones that were already the most vulnerable to experiencing negative climate change impacts in the first place. It is well acknowledged in the literature that access to quality and affordable housing can not only advance sustainable initiatives like minimizing private car use and improving transit use, but it can also prevent behavior that is harmful to the environment, like adopting unsustainable coping mechanisms to environmental hazards. In other words, developing sustainable and affordable housing is both a social benefit and an environmental investment. Canadian housing policy has only just begun to address the deeply entrenched systemic issues within its housing system and has yet to empirically evaluate the effectiveness of its policy instruments. And while further research is needed to fully understand whether these policies are doing good or bad, the existence of these new national initiatives signals that hopefully we are inching towards restoring equity and sustainability in our housing system, where the recognition of social equity as a starting point sets us on the right track for achieving lasting sustainable change. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Does anyone have a question for Alice? Um, there's a question from the chat. Hi, Alice, which level of government is most able to help fix some of these problems, especially since all cities have different challenges? That's a great question. Um, so the thing about Canada is that, you know, it's a where it's a federalist state. So there are three major levels of government that all contribute to housing policy. You know, there's the federal government, the provincial government and the municipal government. Um, to my knowledge, um, I wouldn't say, you know, which level of government is most effective. I think the most effective results come from effective collaboration between the three. Um, so, you know, in the past we've seen uh, like the federal government setting more overarching, like larger initiatives and like strategies. And then the provincial governments will sort of um, go into a bit more detail um, and sort of do the more like legislative frameworks and such. And I think we see like municipal governments um, taking action and like doing more of the implementation implementation side of things since, you know, they know their context the best. So hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. <laughs> All right, I guess I'm oh. next then. Yes, thanks, oh. Nicholas. Go ahead. Great. All right, so hello, everyone. My name is Nicholas Pfeiffer, and I will be giving my talk on harnessing the power of bioluminescent microorganisms as a source of sustainable lighting. So bioluminescence is a trait that has evolved for diverse reasons in a variety of animals and plants. A lot of bioluminescence exists in marine environments. One example is the anglerfish that inhabits the deep sea. It uses its bioluminescent lure to entice prey and strikes while they are distracted. Some fish species can even sacrifice a bioluminescent appendage that can distract the predator while it makes its escape. Another example, and the one most famously used for technological applications, is the symbiotic relationship between the Vibrio fishery bacteria and the Hawaiian bobtail squid. Without the presence of the Vibrio bacteria, the moonlight shining down on the bobtail squid would create a silhouette, making it visible to predators. When the bacteria are present in the squid, they produce a glowing effect and focus that glow downwards, destroying the squid's shadow and allowing it to evade predators. This light organ does not even develop in the squid unless it's inoculated by the bacteria. In the morning, the squid expels 90% of the vibrio, allowing a new culture to develop and infect other squid. A compound called luciferin is oxidized by the vibrio, and one of the byproducts of the reaction is light. This only occurs once a certain concentration of bacteria is met. If there are too few bacteria, no light will be produced. Bacteria emit a signaling molecule, and once a threshold of this molecule is met, quorum sensing is activated, 
detected and light is created. So we can genetically modify organisms with tools from this process to create a substitute for traditional indoor and outdoor lighting that can potentially significantly reduce energy usage. Light emitting diodes have increased energy efficiency over traditional incandescent light bulbs, but bioluminescent offers an even colder source of light with some bacteria being able to convert 90% of input energy into visible light. Glowing evergreen oak trees in Mediterranean suburb er suburban areas have been shown to have comparable luminous efficiency to LED lights, and research is currently being done to see if these trees can replace street lights around the globe. Bioluminescent light sources also significantly cut back on light pollution, allowing the stars to shine anywhere. A recent study has also shown the promise of the tobacco plant Nicotiana tobaccum, which emitted 10 to the power of 10 photons per minute when treated with methyl jasminate found in ripe banana skins. Bioluminescent light bulbs for indoor lighting can also be created by supplying a microenvironment with the necessary nutrients required for bioluminescent bacteria to grow. The biggest drawback right now is that these nutrients are completely used up within a couple of hours or days, killing the bacteria. Prolonging the lifetime of these bulbs should be a focus of future research. There is a concern that genetically modified organisms propagate and become invasive in their surrounding environments. Ecosystems are complex and this concern should be taken seriously. Lighting with bioluminescence is still in its very early stages and the effects of escape bacteria have not yet been studied. However, the requirement for quorum would limit unwanted glowing. Visually stunning and a very green alternative, a sustainable future can and should involve the walk through a city square glow with bacteria or reading a book in a room lit by plants from Cameron's Pandora. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Do we have a question for Nicholas? Jim? Uh, very fascinating talk, uh, Nicholas. What's, so you need chemical energy to fuel this. What's the best source to, to generate that in your mind? How, how would this work in, uh, in So the, the light bulbs, I want to start up that I read about was um, Ambio, which is a Dutch startup. And the problem they were having was that the algae they were using would produce a dim glow every 30 minutes and then die out. So what they found is that they need movement. And if they can simulate movement without within this microenvironment with the salt water and the nutrients, then the bacteria can glow more consistently. But once again, these nutrients get used up within a few hours or days. So that is where the research is currently. So, so it's, it's solar energy in that case, fueling is photosynthesis? Not necessarily solar because they could be used for indoor lighting. It really is the bacteria themselves producing this glow by oxidizing um, the luciferin, which is a compound. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thanks, Nick. Avery, you're next. Okay, hello, my name is Avery and I'll be presenting to you on um, our federal wetland policy and the specifically the inclusion of known at loss within it. So to begin, um, wetlands are an integral feature of our environment, supporting a variety of organisms and providing several ecosystem services. Historically, Canada had more than 127 million hectares of wetlands, but an estimated 20 million have been damaged through human development. In 1991, Canada introduced the federal policy on wetland conservation, which is aimed at slowing the destruction of wetland ecosystems on federal land and encouraging sustainable practice when development is necessary. The provinces of the country followed suit, each creating their own policies pertaining to the treatment of wetlands in their jurisdictions. At the heart of some of these policies is the known at loss concept, which seeks to balance wetland loss from development with equal or greater wetland restoration and conservation. While theoretically useful in preventing wetland loss, notable barriers exist um, in the effective effectiveness of the policies to lead to sustainable practice and in the feasibility of applied strategies. So firstly, the what Federal policy on wetland conservation strictly applies to wet wetlands on federal land, which only consists of an estimated 25% of Canada's wetlands. The absence of clear mandatory guidelines that apply to all wetlands show apparent results in wetland destruction mitigation as known at loss off offsets are impaired by a lack of compliance and consensus, consensus on information. Additionally, the federal wetland policy recommends a mitigation hierarchy of avoidance, minimization and compensation when unavoidable which is where no net loss applies. This can inspire a false sense of security that the pace of wetland ecosystem destruction for development 
can continue without repercussions as long as a wet, another wetland can be simply be fixed or bought as an equal exchange, however. This also includes, um, this inclusion also assumes that wetlands perform an equal function for their respective landscapes, as there are no provisions or requirements for what re replacement wetlands characteristics should be. Moving on, uh, the feasibility of restoration strategies strongly affects the effectiveness of the policy. Due to the dynamic nature of wetlands and the still developing science of their restoration, there are often mixed results with success, nullifying the known at loss when failure arises. Additionally, restored or newly created wetlands may have a time lag before becoming ecologically productive, leading, leaving a landscape without the important ecosystem services it requires for long spans of time. Further integral aspects of restoration projects are not specified, including the economic ability to sustain long-term projects, capability of full compensation for damages to ecosystem function, and monitoring potentially indefinitely. Federal and provincial legislation has thus far shown a desire to acknowledge the value of Canada's wetlands and try to protect them, but still has room for improvement. Refinement of policies to include increased compliance, adaptive management, and tailored approaches are necessary to make no lot loss truly sustainable. Thank you. Thanks, Avery. Does anyone have a question for Avery? I would like to have a, uh, ask you a kind of question that echoes what um, what Alice was asked about the levels of government. There, I recently heard a story on CBC about a wetland in Toronto or near Toronto um, that they're trying to put a, a big development on. Um, yeah. So with that one, I think at this point it's safe now that um, they've decided not to build on it, but. I feel like what Alice said again, there needs to be more collaboration between the levels of government, um, especially on agreeing what policies to apply when a wetland stands in the way of development, um, because every province has their own specific plan and strategy for these things. Um, with that case, there's a, a ministerial zoning order was used, which effectively like bypasses all of the legislation. So it's kind of a special case. Um, Preferably, this wouldn't be used in, the, in terms of wetland development, but I'm not really sure what to do about those kinds of things. Thanks. Julia um, had a question as well. Sorry, I missed it earlier. Would you like to ask? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask, um, how is the protection of wetlands compares to other countries um, in, in regards to Canada? So most of the literature I read was either in the provinces or uh, some things in the states. And they also have varying uh, policies between each state, but some states have better ones than others. Like um, one location had a very specific ratio for wetland that you're allowed to destroy versus how much you need to protect in, um, after that. Uh, some specify the type of wetland as well. Like I think there are bits and pieces we can learn from other places to integrate into one better policy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Avery. Um, next up, we have Tanya. Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Tanya, and today I will be talking about freedom space for rivers. So since the earliest civilizations, rivers and watercourses have always been central to the development of human society, from the provision to drinking water, to agriculture, sanitation, and transportation. However, since then, our rivers have undergone unprecedented change, particularly in the intensity of our engineering interventions causing unforeseen consequences to both humans and our natural ecosystems. A common practice used in many engineering interventions is to uh, straighten or restrict, or in other words, channelize naturally occur occurring streams. This is frequently used in cities and agricultural lands to increase flow to excavate water quickly um, usually for navigability, flood control, and land reclamation. However, this heightened flow velocity can increase the risk of major flooding downstream due to faster and sudden delivery of water, and also cause erosion in unexpected places, which can destabilize banks and block narrow streams. With increase of occurrence of flooding events due to climate change, consequences of mismanaging rivers uh, could cause widespread destruction and could even be fatal. 
Not only are these interventions risky for people, but they also degrade ecological habitats by creating habitat homogeneity and restricting floodplain connectivity. As a result, uh, these, engineers, these engineered interventions can be quite expensive, require frequent maintenance, can exacerbate flooding, and also degrade natural ecosystems. So Freedom Space for Rivers offers a sustainable approach to river management. This concept identifies the river's natural range of mobility and flood zones to three different degrees. The first level of freedom identifies where the river commonly floods and moves, and this is considered the minimum space required for the river to maintain its usual functions. This area is calculated using geomorphological tools to identify risk-prone areas in river corridors and can include important floodplains and wetlands. The second and third level show areas that will likely be occupied or affected by uh, the river over longer time periods or in very uh, rare occurrences. This, co this concept has also been shown to be adaptable to possible future climate change conditions. By collecting data over long-term historical timescales, freedom space appears to be robust under different hydroclimatic conditions where flooding became, um, might become more frequent. It also has been shown um, to be a cost-benefit solution as studied in three Quebec rivers that analyze the trade-off between space for rivers and other uses of land. Freedom space showed a net benefit mainly due to cost savings from bank and flood protection, construction and maintenance, as well as ecosystem benefits. Sustainable management of rivers can therefore be promoted by implementing freedom space for rivers and river management legislation, and it exemplifies how flooding and ecosystem resilience to climate change can be improved in comparison with traditional river management approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. We have questions for Tanya. Jim? Great talk, Tanya. Um, you know, we're here, we are living in Montreal, uh, 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 the big city on a river. Do you see this as, uh, I mean, there's not much space around the city. Is this something we implement in the watershed upstream or how does one reconcile big cities on rivers with the concept? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are some cities that have been integrating this in urban spaces. It's definitely trickier because we already have enroached so much on the riverbanks. Um, so we try to identify places where we haven't enroached so much. I um, mean, a good case study of this was in Taiwan. So they, it, it was very difficult to be able to move um, to have like managed retreat of areas that were already had um, property on it, but it is possible. And there were positive outcomes of doing that. Um, in terms of maintaining flood management and also beautifying the area where property costs increased. So although it's quite tricky, I um, mean, it requires a lot of planning and also um, um, discussion with the local communities, it's still possible in urban areas. Great, thank you. A question from Margo as well. She answered my question, actually. I was wondering about international um, examples. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, next up, we have Caden. Hello, everyone. My name is Caden Schwartz, um, and welcome to my presentation about why we need to rethink forest management. Um, I'll first talk about what forest management is, why it matters, and then I'll talk about um, an often overlooked aspect of forest health and why it's critical to take into account. So what is forest management? Um, in a sentence, forest management is defined as human action related to cutting down, preserving, or altering a forest. Typical techniques include timber extraction, planting, and replanting of different tree species, um, building and maintenance of roads through forests, and fire prevention. So why does forest management matter? Uh, well, current forest management practices, particularly clear cutting and road building to harvest timber and high fire suppression, have long-term negative impacts on many ecosystems. They include reducing biodiversity, harming the carbon sequestration potential of the forest, altering existing drainage networks, and impacting future uh, structure of the forest and distribution of species. These practices also have long-term negative effects on forest microbial networks, which recent studies have shown to be a vital aspect of forest ecosystems. Um, forest management practices have really wide-ranging effects, especially considering the amount of forest managed in this way. For example, here in Quebec, more than half the province is covered in forest, equating to over 900,000 square kilometers of forest cover. It's also important to consider that many indigenous people depend on and use these forests and are typically not considered and excluded from the management plan. So this is all to say that a reevaluation of our current practices is needed, especially for timber stands. Um, techniques such as prescribed fire and thinning have been shown to be beneficial for carbon sequestration and biodiversity, 
um, long-term management plans have been used in Europe to take a more holistic view of the forest. Um, and also the inclusion of indigenous people in forest management plans um, positively impacts many who directly rely on forests. Um, these techniques don't address the problem of destruction of microbial networks. So how could we address that problem? Um, recent studies show that trees and other plants communicate using this network via electrical impulses, as well as exchange nutrients, carbon, and buffer disease immunity throughout the forest. Uh, microbial networks greatly impact forest health, and access to existing microbial networks in forests is not considered during management. Um, how would we begin to visualize them in order to protect them in a forest? Um, so there are a few different techniques to map trees that are connected via a similar microbial network. Um, this typically involves analysis of DNA markers present in the roots of trees, as has been de uh, demonstrated by Dr. Simard. Um, but this requires analysis of every tree of a specific species in a timber stand, and it's expensive and time consuming. Um, methods of examining microbial networks in the lab involve scanning electron microscopes and autoradiography. Um, if it were possible to analyze microbial networks using a more cost effective and timely method in larger timber stands, this would allow us to reduce harming a vital part of the forest ecosystem. In conclusion, a rethinking of forest management is necessary that considers much more than we do today. In particular, more attention needs to be paid to microbial networks and forests before we go ahead with more clear cutting. Thanks. Thanks, Caden. Does anyone have a question for Caden? I do if nobody else does. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that uh, prescribed burning can have a positive effect on carbon sequestration. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, it allows for um, basically bigger and, and a wider variety of trees to grow um, because it it's sort of a natural part of the ecosystem that um, the, the fire suppression is sort of the not it wasn't um, part of the ecosystem before humans um, or particularly European settlers arrived. And um, so it allows for more biodiversity, which ends up having a higher carbon sequestration potential. Thanks so much, Caden. Next up, Rain. Yes. Hi, my name is Rainforest Noakes, and I just wanted to thank you all for being here. So as Canadians, national parks are more than just landscapes. They are symbols of the rich natural diversity that makes our land so iconic and meaningful to us. As the effects of climate change and biodiversity loss manifest within our borders, these issues become more pressing and more common. However, our regard for the national park system remains part of our national identity. I'm here today to tell you that the fate of Canadian national parks is in jeopardy, largely due to misguided values, weak policy, and decades of negligence by Parks Canada Agency. The Panel on Ecological Integrity of Canada's National Parks stated that the integrity of Canada's national parks is under threat for many courses and for many reasons. These threats to Canada's national sacred places present a crisis of national importance. This report was published in 2000, when approximately 97% of parks suffered from some form of ecological impairment, 88% suffering from significant cumulative effects, and 54% suffering from severe ecological stresses. In this report, the panel ascertained that there were several pressing ecological issues, habitat loss and fragmentation, loss of large carnivores, air pollution, pesticides, invasive species, and natural resource development. Another major stress is visitor overcrowding and the development of national parks for visitor use. Increased visitation to parks can lead to overuse of facilities such as sewage treatment systems, overdevelopment, and a myriad of other problems that in turn degrade air and water quality, cause erosion, and damage wildlife habitat. Following this tragic report, Parks Canada produced policy that required all national parks to publish a report every five years as an accountability mechanism. Parks Canada only formally began monitoring for ecological integrity in 2008 as a direct response to this report and another report in 2005 from the Commissioner of Environment and Sustainable Development. Parks Canada Agency is currently monitoring one to six ecosystem indicators in 42 national parks respectively using baseline data from over 10 years. 
The new consolidated guidelines in, published in 2011 have consistently implemented a scientific protocol with quantitative thresholds. Although there has clearly been much improvement, there is still a dire need to hold Parks Canada, Parks Canada and the Minister of Environment accountable to their mandate through transparent, robust scientific, scientific monitoring, public pressure and political will. It will be imperative to strictly manage visitation to national parks and to incorporate Indigenous traditional knowledge in the years to come. Developing a more detailed understanding of the effects of human activities will have on ecological integrity of parks will allow us to develop a subsequent visitor mitigation effects plan. If we hope to protect these iconic examples of Canadian national heritage and meet our national sustainable development goals, we should start by managing our parks more effectively and more responsibly. Developing exhaustive and comprehensive ecological integrity monitoring methodology now will aid us on our journey towards harmonizing human activities with the natural world. Personally, I will be continuing my research as part of the resource conservation team in Banff National Park this summer as a field technician. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Rain. Are there questions for Rain? Jim? I could ask one, Sarah. Thanks, Rain. That was great. I know you love Banff and so do I, but how do you reconcile people just needing to be in touch with nature with, you know, the, the challenging of the ecological integrity? How would you manage that? Uh, so it's a very difficult question. And personally, I think that um, greater collaboration between the federal and provincial levels of government on green spaces and uh, leisure sports in nature would have huge effects and able to manage the overall volume of people wanting to interact with nature in a more responsible way that would mitigate the overall footprint of human activities in the natural environment for leisure purposes. And Great. otherwise, I think just general uh, formal education on uh, ecological footprints and uh, just overall leave no trace principles when entering the natural environment also have a huge effect on a more personal level. Okay, so not necessarily fewer people, but smarter tourism? That, that Yes, I, I think that certain caps may be required in, uh, you know, uh, flagship environments such as Banff, where they are have international appeal. I think in high ticket areas or high item areas, there should be a little bit more responsible management. And overall, I think through general education and municipal or provincial management, we should be able to manage the rest pretty effectively. A quick question from Alexandria, too. Oh, you're muted. Alexandria, you're muted. I always do that. Sorry, everyone. Um, I was going to say that um, what's your intake on the facts that sometimes the parks do sell their passes on sale as a way to push volume into the parks? Yes. Yeah, so this is another very tricky issue, and that's much more on the policy end of things. So Parks Canada Agency is a decentralized agency. So there, every park is managed a little bit differently. So it creates a huge inconsistency, and it kind of forces us to take a case-by-case -case approach. Um, however, I do think, and that is something that I'm going to incorporate into my research, is the overall amount of money spent on uh, resource conservation as opposed to infrastructure development for tourists. And I think that that dual mandate of trying to provide visitor experience and conserve the natural environment are very much contradictory and create a, uh, a systemic issue that is uh, currently, we're currently seeing the, eco the ecological integrity of parks suffering for that issue in the mandate. So I think that to address that issue, it's gonna be on the policy side and the overall organizational structure of Parks Canada. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thanks very much, Rain. Uh, Vincenzo? Good morning, everyone. My name is Vincenzo, and I'm here for three minutes of your time. As I struggled to frame my project within these allotted three minutes, I realized maybe the answer was to frame my project in three minutes. The sustainability of our oceans are under attack. Every three minutes, we over harvest 700,000 pounds worth of marine life. Every three minutes, we pump 64 tons of plastic pollution into the ocean. And every three minutes, we destroy 16 square kilometers of ocean habitat. The combination of these pressures have put an incredible strain on marine ecosystems. But there is hope. Hope in the form of marine protected areas, also known as MPAs. MPAs have become the weapon of choice used the globe over to combat marine biodiversity loss. So much so that since 2016, 
every three minutes, we've designated seven square kilometers to MPAs. And rightfully so. They have a, demonstrated a positive impact on marine com community composition and biomass, not just within their boundaries, but also the surrounding waters. Yet the three minutes coming will not be the same as the three minutes past. MPAs and their static spatial design render them ill-equipped to confront the new dynamic stressor that is climate change. Because as we all know, every three minutes, the globe is getting slightly warmer, the ocean slightly more acidic, and species move slightly more poleward. Now, MPA's intended purpose is to conserve biodiversity and protect marine life within their designated boundaries. But climate change undermines their ability to achieve those targets by forcibly redrawing the boundaries and habitat for much of the marine life we are striving to protect. This leaves managers of MPAs asking, what can they do? What measures can be taken to anticipate, adapt to, and mitigate the consequences of climate change? These questions alone have highlighted a sustainability problem for MPAs, their inherent lack of planning for this new stressor. My research lies in one possible solution to this problem, and it's through connecting managers to the management plans that address climate change. Because ultimately, if we want sustainability, we need to first step back and plan for it. As such, I've compiled an open source database of current MPA management plans and actions in response to climate change. I've broken down the actions into their components and grouped them to specific effects of climate change, and in so doing, have created a toolkit for managers to access. This gives the managers the ability to create a customized management plan catered to their specific climate vulnerabilities, allowing them to leave with something concrete in hand and a potential path forward. This is an example of the kind of problem solving which will help with sustainable research in the hopes that together we can make sure the next three minutes are a sustainable three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Anyone have questions? I don't want to miss anybody. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little more about um, how the specific problems associated with, with making protected areas in oceans. I mean, you know, the, the boundaries in oceans are less clear, but what else, what other kinds of issues do we encounter? I mean, it, well, the largest issue that it covers is, especially in the recent times, there's a big trend to be able to meet a lot of international targets of doing large scale marine protected areas. And ultimately, you know, they're, they're being referred to sometimes as paper parks because they're designated, they have boundaries, but there's no monitoring system set up to, to actually verify what's happening. So there's this uh, company called globalfishingwatch.org that's been tracking uh, fishing fleets around the world. And one of the recent studies noticed that uh, for some of these fishing fleets within uh, protected areas, there's 50% more fishing effort than outside the protected areas. So they're establishing these parks, but if there's no way to patrol and protect the parks, ultimately it's just a, a great place for you know trawlers to go and harvest. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, next up, we have Jan. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Jan, and I'll be presenting on the sustainability of coral reefs. So coral reefs, they're the poster boy for tropical tourism, where you can find Nemo, Dory, and over 4,000 other species of fish. However, they are dying, as this epoch, the Anthropocene, is placing more strain on them than ever before. Their sustainable management is crucial. And in three minutes, I hope to leave you with an understanding of not only the threats they currently face, but opportunities that provide a beacon of hope for the future. The threats to coral reef sustainability can be divided into two basic categories, near field and far field stressors. Near field stressors to coral reefs are impacts that are caused by local phenomenon that are under the direct influence of the local populace, such as overfishing and pollution. Overfishing is a serious issue on coral reefs as the removal of key species which provide critical grazing functions leaves reefs vulnerable and exposed. This problem is expected to worsen in the future, 
as population growth rates are projected to increase the number of active fishers in the tropical reef belt, which will place even more pressure on the world's already overexploited reef fishery. Pollution is another near field stressor, which can come from oil and chemicals spilled from ships or via watershed degradation from the land, which increases the load of silt, nutrient, and pollutant transport from rivers into the ocean. Far field stressors refer to stressors which act over global or regional scale and refers to problems brought about by change in market forces and large scale environmental changes such as sea level rise. Sea level rise is expected to cause significant coastal flooding, which leads to sediment and contaminant remobilization. This, coupled with the removal of 35% of the world's mangroves, which are important buffers between land and reef, means reefs can expect more pollutant and sediment stress in the future. Population growth in the future is expected to impact market forces by increasing the demand for fish worldwide, while an increase in global GDP is expected to drive the luxury market for corals, leading to further exploitation of reefs. However, all is not lost, as the concept of concave trophic pyramids, a form of sustainable fisheries, provides an opportunity for promoting sustainability. The idea behind this is that this pyramid structure strives to maintain an accumulation of biomass at both the base and peak of the trophic pyramid. This structure maintains an abundance of ecologically important species at the base of the trophic pyramid that provide critical grazing functions to reefs, while also maintaining high biomass of predators at the top of the trophic pyramid, which are high value fishery targets. This high biomass of predators means that locals have access to higher quality catches, which provides more income, reduces poverty, and increases food security. Meanwhile, the high biomass of species at the base of the pyramid ensures that reefs can maintain essential ecological functioning. This is therefore a win-win for both people and nature, as it ultimately serves to reduce poverty while maintaining ecosystem productivity in the long run. Thanks, Jan. Questions for Jan? I'm wondering if you could tell us more about the relationship between mangroves and coral reefs. Right, so mangroves essentially act as important buffers. They trap sediment and nutrients that flow from the land going into the ocean. So that's sort of the frontier which protect reefs from sediment pollution and their removal, which is currently, I think over 35% of the world's mangroves, it sort of removes this important buffer and leaves reefs exposed to sediment and pollutant stress, which I just lost you at there, Jan, at the end. Could you please repeat the last thing you said? Oh yeah, no, especially if the current rate of removal is consistent moving forward, then they can definitely expect more pollutant and sediment stress um, moving forward. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Our uh, next presenter is Margot. Hi everyone, my name is Margot burgess -Polet. Thank you for having me today. As some of you might remember last summer, Montreal had a surprise visit from a young humpback whale in its harbor. For us, those visits are rare and special. However, mammals from the ocean regularly receive visits and disturbances caused by humans. Canada's oceans are home to more than 40 marine mammals, 14 of which are considered endangered or threatened, and many more in decline because of human activities. Today, I wanna to talk about one specific threat to marine mammals noise pollution due to commercial shipping, oil and gas exploration, sonars, and offshore construction. Human caused sounds have contributed to a doubling of noise levels every 10 years since 1950s in the ocean. Marine mammals use their acoustics for many things such as navigation, hunting, reproduction, and communication. Impacts of noise on marine mammals include injury, feeding, reproduction, and localization difficulties which threaten their ability to sustain. Negative impacts from human-caused noise pollution on marine mammals have been recognized. However, in a report from 2018 by the Commissioner of Environment and Sustainable Development, concluded that Canada did little to protect marine mammals from risk. So how do we ensure that human development does not have a significant adverse effect on marine mammals when it comes to noise pollution? Canada has a tool I wanna to talk about, Environmental Assessment or EA for short. An EA is a required process to identify, predict, and evaluate the potential effect of a proposed project. 
Currently, there are over 70 development projects under EA review that are either located on a coast or in Canadian water. As a standalone tool to evaluate impacts of a project, EA is not enough. It does not allow to look closely enough at the cumulative effect that many projects can have together. As the saying goes, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The Canadian coast needs to undergo regional EA, which are studies conducted in geographically defined areas of existing or anticipated development to inform planning and management of cumulative effects. There are two recognized solutions that emerge for marine conservation when it comes to noise and that regional EA can help with. First, to diminish overall noise level, regional EA allows to set maximum threshold adapted to the local species and specificities. It allows planning for noise mitigation measures, such as slowing down ship or noise management technology, or to simply reject development projects that prevent to meet the thresholds. Second, it allows to plan to create spatial temporal exclusion zones, such as marine protected areas, and can help Canada meet its goal to protect 30% of its ocean by 2030. To conclude, I would like to support that regional EA should be systematically used in order to mitigate noise pollution impact on marine mammals in Canada. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Margo. Does anyone have a question for Margo? I could ask a question. Great talk, Margo. Um, you know, I, I hate leaf blowers. But I think what you're talking about is more serious. Can you just say why noise is so important for marine mammals, as opposed to you know the, the other things that you could have talked about? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we can talk about the impacts, obviously, of noise. Um, to me, it's important because it's simple to fix compared to other things. Um, you know, we talk about the oceans, we talk about plastic pollution. It's very difficult to address such issues, they're global. But when it comes to noise, you know, protecting an area, uh, looking at uh, specific um, um, like species and seeing like, oh, where are there reproduction, for example, and stopping ships to, from going to such zones when those reproduction happen, um, you know, they're, they're, they're important things that we can act on by simply reducing noise, reducing the amount of um, activities that we, the impact that we have. So to me, that's why it was very important and, and honestly enlightening because I only learned about that topic really recently. Thank you. Thank you. There's a quick question from Alexandria too. Thank you. Um, I find right now because COVID is happening, uh, there's not as much, uh, let's say, maybe commercial traffic for a while, and there's definitely not as much tourism around some areas. Um, I do have a friend at the University of Quebec at Rimouski who's doing research on sound too. Um, have you come across any research that is collecting data right now as like a baseline for where there's less noise? Yes, actually, actually, there's very interesting uh, research being done in the Vancouver Harbor because there are some uh, killer whales orcas that are um, threatened over there. So there's a project from the Ocean Conservancy um, that are actually collecting data and there's, it's a great opportunity because they've measured that since COVID happened, because of the decrease of commercial shipping, there's like 20% less noise. So they're hoping to see what impact that's gonna have on, on animals. Thank you. Thanks so much. Over to Emily. Go ahead, Emily. Hi. Um, so my name is Emily Collins and I'm a graduate student at Concordia in the lab of Dr. Robert Luaji. Our lab studies topics in population ecology and conservation. And today I'll be presenting my work on the development of remote camera traps as non-invasive surveying tools in great ape research. The Campo Man National Park in Southern Cameroon represents important habitat for sympatric Western gorillas and central chimpanzees. Both species are listed as critically endangered with poaching disease and shifts in land use representing major threats. Effective conservation measures are therefore crucial to protect the remaining populations and prevent extinction of the species. Obtaining accurate metrics on distribution, occupancy, and habitat use is necessary to inform effective and appropriate conservation strategies for wild great ape populations. 
However, human presence within the protected areas, even for research purposes, including habituation projects and population surveying, can increase the risk of disease transmission and illegal hunting. The goal of developing remote camera traps as a tool for monitoring populations is to reduce the human presence within great ape habitats. If we can visit the camera locations once a month to collect the data, rather than conducting line transects or direct observations on a daily or weekly basis, we may alleviate some of the risks involved with human researchers entering great ape habitats. However, the accuracy of using remote camera traps as a surveying tool for primate populations is still under development. My research will investigate the occupancy of gorillas and chimpanzees in various habitat zones within the Campo Man National Park. In parallel with traditional line transect nest counts, I'll employ remote camera traps in a grid throughout the park to collect data on presence or absence of great apes within different areas of habitat. I will assess the accuracy of camera traps by comparing the camera data with transect nest count estimates on occupancy. If estimates from camera traps are adequately reliable in comparison with transect counts, cameras could foreseeably become standalone monitoring devices for chimpanzees and gorilla populations within the Campo Man National Park and potentially elsewhere. In addition, people from local communities could become involved in these initiatives. Members of our lab are already working in the Campo Man forested areas and collaborate with local guides and park employees. The photos on this slide showing a juvenile gorilla on the top and chimpanzees were taken by camera traps deployed by Isaac Joko, PhD student in our lab, who's working on the topic of human wildlife conflicts involving forest elephants and local farmers in the Campo area. Community involvement is paramount to successful and ethical conservation initiatives for any species and involving local guides and park employees in the camera initiative is going to be an important part of my project as well. That's all the time I have and thank you everyone for your attention today. Thanks, Emily. Questions for Emily? I have a quick question if nobody else does. Um, how are the cameras triggered? Does the, does the animal have to touch the camera? Is it just within a certain distance? How would um, you, it's, what's your range of measurement? Uh, it's normally uh, a motion sensor trigger. So, yeah. So how, so like five meters? <clears throat> Um, it depends on the specifics of the camera that you're using, um, but you can have a uh, wider field of views or more narrow or more sensitive. You kind of would uh, purchase your equipment that's best designed for whatever your focal species is. And also when you're placing the camera, you would place it in a height that's going to best catch the, the right height of species, basically. Right, thanks. Thanks, Emily. Over to Yisa. Hi, everyone. My name is Yisa, and I'll be talking on building, building a decision support system for the sustainable management of forest and biodiversity in the Afrotropics. Decision support systems are software systems increasingly used by conservation practitioners as efficient and relatively inexpensive approach, approaches for supporting decision making and the long term sustainability of ecosystem services. They have been widely applied in different uh, policy sectors across North America, Europe, Asia, with prominent examples being the SIM43 GSS tool, uh, Monsu the decision support dashboard and TESA. However, limited considerations have been given to the development and application of such tools for efficiently managing forest and biodiversity across the Afrotropics. So in this presentation, I am at identifying the key elements needed for the development of a comprehensive GSS tool for the Afrotropics and to address the specific issues of forest and biodiversity loss that occur in this region such a tool will need to integrate uh, elements of SIM43, Monsu, TESA, and the Decision Support Dashboard. So specific elements that have been integrated in the constructed, constructed GSS uh, tool shown in the screen include uh, multi-criteria evaluation elements such as climate change scenarios, forest management scenarios, landscape matrices, diversity indices, cost-benefit parameters, and web 
and spatial planning elements such as ArcGIS servers, web databases filled with uh, spatial layers, survey data, and maps. So the integrated uh, multi-criteria evaluation elements normally act as important indicators for simulating forest and biodiversity potentials, as well as evaluating economic impacts over time. And they as, as well uh, optimize strategies for identifying priority areas for strategic forest planning under current and future forest management and climate regimes. So the simulated outputs normally uh, as well as uh, ancillary data are normally embedded within open source platforms, which serve as uh, servers for acquiring spatial layers, maps, analyze trends and conditions, and communicating feedbacks to end users. So these and more are very important for the Afrotropics where rates of, rates of forest and biodiversity loss are very alarming and the application of decision support systems in forest and biodiversity management are very weak. Thank you. Thanks, Yusa. Does anyone have a question for Yusa? I'm wondering if you could tell us um, more about what are the, some of the unique challenges that are faced in the Afrotropics compared to other places in the world where some of these systems have been implemented? Um, yeah. The one of the challenges are mostly uh, technological challenges, which involve building uh, such support systems. I mean, there's lack of this technological development in this region, and um, most uh, most studies have built on carrying out policies and other uh, forest certification processes, but usually lack this technology to um, have a system where data as well as uh, outputs from simulations can be used in uh, carrying out decision, uh, carrying out um, in bringing out policy strategies for effective conservation. Thank you, Yusa. Does anyone else have a quick question for Yusa? Okay. Thanks very much. Next up, we have Lana. Uh, yeah, just, uh, sorry, two seconds. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Lana, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about the link between the COVID-19 pandemic and plastic pollution. So while the pandemic did cause a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by early April 2020, the same cannot be said about plastic waste. Prior to the pandemic, plastic pollution was an issue that became quite popular worldwide. For example, led to movements such as the Save the Turtles movement. Major corporations like Starbucks uh, stopped serving plastic disposable straws. Uh, it also led to political decisions such as the banning of plastic bags, which were overall considered to be ineffective by researchers. And in addition to that, some regions had single use plastic bans scheduled, but they were postponed amid COVID concerns. And this is problematic because in addition to ineffective and postponed bans, the pandemic further fueled plastic pollution, undermining sustainability efforts. And this was seen in different ways, though they all led to the same outcome, more plastic pollution. Uh, the first way was through the use of person, personal protection equipment, which led to the dramatic generation of medical waste. Uh, PPEs were not only used by healthcare professionals, but also by people outside the medic medical fields, uh, like ordinary citizens. And at the same time, uh, the production of virgin plastics surged during the pandemic. So when oil prices dropped, the price of plastic also dropped. This in return benefited the plastic industry as it became cheaper to produce virgin plastics than recycled plastics. Uh, following that increase of virgin plastics, consumer behavior and food packaging led to an increase of the demand, use and disposal of single use plastics. So fear and paranoia pushed consumers to buy food that was already prepacked in plastic containers and use plastic bags. And because of lockdowns, there was an over-reliance on food delivery services, which further sustains this plastic packaging waste generation we see today. Some researchers believe that because of convenience habits picked up during the pandemic, like online shopping, will persist for a long time. Therefore, now the question becomes, how do we deal with this surge in plastic waste? Well, 
researchers propose institutional changes as one of the important approaches to reducing plastic pollution. For example, our current, current waste management systems already have a hard time keeping up with existing plastic waste. Therefore, uh, governments need to improve those systems to officially maximize the collection and recycling of that waste. In addition to that, governments also need to implement stricter policies on, pol on plastic production, use, and consumption. Um, overall, I believe a solution cannot be a single component. Waste management systems will not work on their own. It requires a combination of methods working at the same time and a combination of changes, therefore more than just institutional changes. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Questions for Lana? You were mentioning that um, some of the legislation, the earlier um, single use plastic legislation has been shown to be ineffective. Can you tell us a bit more about why that is and how that might be improved to make it effective? Um, well, so one of the first examples I can think of is actually here in Montreal. So uh, we have a plastic ban a plastic bag ban right uh, I think a certain thickness so the solution to that was to just make them thinner so it's not really getting rid of the the problem another thing that I uh, came across was actually uh, Kenya so apparently they have the uh, strictest plastic uh, bag ban in the world however that's that's uh, where I got my information from researchers were not finding that effective because uh, bags are still being smuggled into the country so it wasn't really solving the problem um and the solution to that is honestly i i really don't know because it's it is a very complex problem and um i guess even like even with the strict with the strictest policies in place there's always some either a loophole or illegal activities that happen and it is harder to control so i guess i i, I really don't know it's it's a complex it's a very complex problem Thanks, Lana. Next up is Julia. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Lana, for that uh, really great segue into this next presentation, uh, which is gonna be looking at how to kind of eliminate plastic using bioremediation. Um, so plastic waste has proven over time to be difficult to manage. National plastic recycling rates are low and much of our plastic still ends up in our landfills or natural environments. Over time, plastic photodegrades into microplastics, and when this occurs, it becomes even more difficult to manage, as they are not visible to the human eye. In this presentation, I will first explore how fungi can modulate naturally occurring bioremediation, and then I will examine how scientists identify and test fungi's ability to break down plastic in two case studies. So bioremediation is seen as a potential solution, especially for managing the increasing accumulation of microplastics, as fungi have a natural ability to detect and attach onto plastic surfaces through the production of hydrophobins. Once attached to these surfaces, enzymatic actions are triggered in order to begin the degradation of the plastic surface into different polymer stages until it is completely mineralized and consumed by the fungi. The study of by Brunner et al. identified the types of fungi isolated on plastic debris on the shoreline of Lake Zurich. Among the hundreds of fungi that they identified, only four species possessed enzyme, enzymes with the capability for plastic degradation. When testing the fungi strains ability to degrade different types of plastic, they concluded that none of the strains were capable of degrading polyethylene. The authors highlight that there is potential for the degradation of polyurethane. However, under this study, the process was quite inefficient. So the authors recommend uh, the addition of plastic degrading enzymes into the plastic material during manufacturing to increase the efficiency of degradation. So in the article by Russell et al, the authors used endophytes isolated from plant stems found in the Ecuadorian rainforest. Endophytes are microorganisms found in the inner tissue of plants without causing them any harm, and they tend to reach their greatest diversity in tropical forests. 
59 fungal endophytes were tested for their polyurethane degradation capacities, and of these, 18 exhibited polyurethane consumption. Additionally, the five most active microorganisms were capable of degradation using the polyurethane as the coal carbon sources, and it was also successful when tested in anaerobic environments. So the case studies explored in this review allow for a deeper understanding of which type of fungi have the ability to degrade certain types of plastics. Additionally, the developments shared are crucial in understanding fungi's role in plastic management and illustrate a need uh, for research in order to increase the biodegrading capabilities of fungi. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, Rebecca, you have a question? Hi, Julia. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I have a quick question. When you're talking about the degradation of plastic, do you mean we're getting rid of the problem or we're just breaking it down into smaller pieces of things that will still be a problem? Uh, no, well, um, according to the, uh, the studies I've looked at, they actually are able to completely mineralize and uh, consume the plastic. So it does actually get rid of it completely. Um, but as I mentioned, the process is really inefficient at the moment. So it's not exactly our solution yet. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions for Julia? Quick question. Oh, um, there's a question from um, the attendees. So Tristan McKenna says, hello. So what might applications of the fungi to plastic look like? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, I, I didn't really look into it that much because I was more just looking at how it's possible in a lab, but I guess the application in the future um, on a wider scale that would, it's not really there yet, just yet, as far as I've seen. So don't have the best answer for that, but yeah, it's being developed in the labs. Okay, thanks. Michael, over to you. Thank you. Uh... Good, I'm not muted. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you about death. Uh, in North America, we tend to ignore the subject and doing so can lead to unsustainable choices. I know this is a delicate topic, so I want to state clearly and respectfully that this is not a critique of any religious or cultural practice. So I started with the question, can we make the death care industry more sustainable? Sustainability here means making choices that involve the least number of negative environmental impacts and, if possible, providing an environmental benefit. To answer my question, I'll first consider what makes the death care industry unsustainable. So looking at the chart on the slide, we can see traditional burial and cremation, which are the two most popular methods, are also the most environmentally taxing. Tons of metal, wood, and concrete are required in burial and fuel and electricity for cremation. Embalming chemicals are carcinogenic, though common in burial, the embalmed can also be cremated. Both methods contaminate soils, groundwater, and produce CO2 and other pollutants. And finally, burial plot ownership is indefinite. So green burial is a return to historical methods involving the burial of unembalmed remains within a biodegradable casket or shroud. This is very common globally. Choosing green burial can help conserve land as land with remains cannot be developed in many North American jurisdictions. On the downside, however, caskets and shrouds consume resources and there is the potential for groundwater contamination if many are buried in close proximity. Uh, so alkaline hydrolysis involves water, heat and lye. After a three hour process, the results are solid fragmentary remains and a basic solution that can be safely released into water treatment systems. Le Sur Funeraire Complex in Granby were the first in Quebec to offer this service in 2015. And finally, natural organic reduction. Remains are laid on a bed of wood chips, plant matter and added microbes. In 30 days, the result is about a cubic yard of nutrient packed soil then can be returned to the family. It is the lack of resources going into the process and the direct benefit of the product to the environment that yields sustainability. Late last year, Recompose of Seattle 
were the first in North America to offer this service. So hurdles uh, for the last two methods lie with our cultural aversion to making death care plans and the lack of public exposure to normalize these methods. So yes, we can make the death care industry more sustainable, but to do so is a personal choice on a societal scale with a finite amount of space and resources and recognition of our partnership with the planet, hopefully our final choices can be sustainable ones. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. There's a, a question um, from Anne-Sophie. Are there any governmental barriers in Canada to these more sustainable burial practices? Why are these not a problem in other countries? Well, the laws are complicated. So in the United States, there is actually no law uh, that you need to be embalmed, for example. Um, in Canada, similar laws exist. It really is a question of supply not being there because demand isn't there. Uh, very few people know about, other me about methods other than standard burial and cremation. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Uh, Quebec, I believe now has two alkaline hydrolysis facilities um, and the natural organic reduction uh, is not yet in Canada. Thanks, I think there was another question. Uh, there was a hand raised, but I didn't see who. Actually, um, Alexandria. Yes, thank you. Uh, part of the question was answered. It had to do with the um, legality. And I was just curious. So our, our culture is not really comfortable making these kind of arrangements. And sometimes it's left towards other family. But the other question about it is the cost. Where does it fall on the cost scale, scale for the uh, natural organic? Uh, reduction versus, let's say, a traditional um, cremation, let's say, since it's cheaper, I guess, than the burial? It depends on the options that you want. So a standard funeral is around 10,000. Uh, cremation with a viewing and uh, which includes a, a casket rental um, is around 5,000. Uh, although it can be substantially cheaper if, if you decide to just go with the basics. Um, alkaline hydrolysis, I don't know of the exact price, although it is substantially cheaper, um, simply because lye is, is really quite inexpensive and water is as well. Um, we're looking at perhaps $1,500. Uh, the uh, the um, natural oxidation uh, reduction uh, currently is $5,500. However, there is only one facility that exists that offers this service and it's kind of a trial run. Um, it was actually developed from a architect's thesis of how to incorporate death within the city. Um, so I think as it becomes more widespread and people are more comfortable with it, supply will decrease uh, the, uh, the cost. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michael. We have last but not least, Alexa. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alexa. So Muskrat Lake is a lake near Cobden, Ontario, and is extremely eutrophic for its size. It has had reoccurring cyanobacteria or blue-green algae blooms that have occurred since the 1980s and have been increasing in frequency. Blue-green algae can be toxic to fish and humans, which has caused the lake to be closed to recreational activities such as swimming and fishing during the late summer months in recent years. Due to these concerns, the commu community has formed a local watershed council called the Mus Muskrat Watershed Council in 2012 to perform analysis on the watershed of current water quality, the causes of blue-green algae, and how the community can potentially limit future blooms from occurring. So community-based monitoring is an approach that has been used in Canada since the early 2000s to monitor water quality and is being used by the Muskrat Watershed Council 
uh, for a similar approach. So the goal for this analysis was to determine how community-based monitoring can promote sustainability and address climate change impacts at a local level using the Muskrat Watershed Council as a case study. An exploratory analysis of literature and documents produced by the Muskrat Watershed Council was performed to address this research question and to gain a deeper understanding of the history of the council itself. So the results from this analysis are similar to current existing literature, such as the Muskrat watershed being seen as beneficial as it fills in gaps in provincial and federal funding for current lake management programs. The Muskrat Watershed Council has also been seen to promote sustainability and can address climate change as it can create educational programs that meet the community's needs and also can create um, naturalization and restoration programs that can be implemented on the watershed itself to the unique needs of the lake. However, there are some limitations to community-based monitoring, such as lack of volunteer help, which limits the ability to perform, perform certain projects, and projects are often selected, selected based on community interest, so they may, may not necessarily align to sustainable ways of thinking. This could, uh, community-based Monitoring can also be limited due to its uh, data collection process not always meeting provincial or federal standards, which makes community-based monitoring, monitoring results uh, to be more general or at overall trend analysis. So further studies could be performed using qualitative methodologies of the Muskrat Watershed Council and the surrounding community to understand how they perceive their work as being beneficial, its limitations and impacts in the community, and also future opportunities of how community-based monitoring can be used in the Muskrat watershed to promote sustainability and address local climate change. Thank you. Thanks, Alexa. Does anyone have a question for Alexa? I have one quick question for you, if there's not another one. Don't want to miss any here. Um, when you're talking about community-based monitoring, do you see a potential for citizen science initiatives like using apps on smartphones and um, in local communities to, to do ecological monitoring? Um, yes, for sure. It's actually being discussed uh, by the Watershed Council at uh, Muskrat Lake as a potential option to get community more involved. Um, there all are limitations to that because, again, like I mentioned about data collection, if the process isn't regulated, the results do tend to be more general and you can't pinpoint why specific things are causing something like an algae bloom. Um, but it does allow for the community to make notes, learn more about their own lake and the environment, and then allows them to learn about possible ways of how they can uh, make changes to their lifestyles and make changes to the community's uh, land use planning as a whole to uh, create a more sustainable future for them. So there are benefits, but there's also those limitations as well to limit the ability of the data to be used as a scientifically accurate. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for your presentations and to the attendees for coming today. Really well done, everybody, on your talks. Nicely said, lots of really interesting presentations. And thanks so much to um, Jim and Rebecca and Anna and Doug for hosting and helping facilitate. Really appreciate it, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to the audience members who stuck around. It was such a great variety of presentations. Uh, we had a, we learned so much, and uh, what a tremendous effort by all of these students and Sarah as well, putting this together um, so well, so well organized. And you all did such an amazing job, kind of concisely speaking in three minutes in a in a very uh, kind of profound way to to invite us into these conversation topics. So thank you. I don't know if Rebecca or Jim want to mention the rest of the day, the events we have upcoming. Did you want to jump in and just invite the folks here to keep joining us throughout the rest of the week and today? Rebecca, yeah? Yes, absolutely. So we have a, a 45 minute break right now and then we have coming up a panel on insects as drivers and also being affected by climate change. This afternoon we have a great panel coming up, a discussion uh, featuring our own Damon Matthews talking about uh, the carbon um, 
carbon budgets. Uh, and then at the end of the day, 4.15 today, we will talk about capitalism and, uh, and science-based targets. The rest of the week looks great as well. So do come back. You can check out the full schedule. There are four events every day between now and Friday. Um, so do check them out online where you found information about this session. Uh, and thank you all for coming. And thank you all to our participants who really were so wonderful and amazing <laughs> about having so little time to present so much. You really all did a great job. So Thank you so much. OK, folks, thanks, Rebecca. On that note, we're going to close off this uh, webinar here. And uh, I did put the link to the rest of the conference proceedings in the chat if you want to check that out. Get in touch with us, info.4, if you have any questions. And we'll let you know about the next events. Um, and uh, what else did I want to say? Oh, yeah, check back in in 15 minutes, half an hour, and so on. Just come back to this channel again and again. We look forward to seeing you all week long. Congrats again. Bye, everybody.